I'm Gelson. I'm a student representative from the Monash Political Awareness Club. And I'm sure you've already heard a lot from our Vice President, Brian. Um, but we would also like to thank Dr. Nazirul for this extremely informative opportunity to be a part of this event, as well as thank the previous speakers as well for all of your very inspiring speeches, right? They're very laden with wisdom, with expertise. And speaking from a much more personal angle, beyond just my participation in MONPAC, the Political Awareness Club, um, this session thus far has been a very informative reminder of the impact that this subject has on my future as a youth, right? There is a multifaceted plethora of different lessons that we can definitely take about the evolution of our society as a digital civilization, right? From the pacing of regulation on data collection to competition of big tech and digital media like WhatsApp. And so as we step into our next academic speaker, we're zooming out towards a much more global perspective. As we delve into the country of Myanmar, we're about to explore a high impact application of digital technology that can literally make or break nations. And who better to teach us about such nuanced material than Dr. Stefan Bechtel? Be Be Bechtel? Dr. Stefan Bechtold is a research fellow at the School of Arts and Social Sciences. His extensive background blends very critical academic research with substantial experience as an evaluator, practitioner, and trainer in the international development and peace building in Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. He has served as an in-country representative in Myanmar for Swiss Peace, as well as a program officer for the Peace Building Analysis and Impact Program in these and in these functions, he has advised, he has evaluated, and has trained numerous institutions like the United Nations, the European Union, um, various governments, both international and local, as well as NGOs and civil society organizations. Currently, Dr. Stefan researches the interactions of digital technologies with the state of Myanmar and Malaysia against the backdrop of the global pandemic, combining approaches from the fields of international political sociology and science and technology studies. So everyone, I would like to invite um, a warm welcome to Dr. Stefan with all this very insightful discussion about blackouts and whitelists, digital technologies and state formation in Myanmar. Yeah. Um, right. Thank you very much for the, the warm welcome and introduction. Uh, I really like that intro. Can I hire you guys to introduce me at other locations, <laughs> maybe? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, yeah, while I let um, Nazirul sort out the tech, um, I... I was really glad when uh, Nasiru kind of pointed out the doom and gloom that is oftentimes associated with uh, digital technologies. And I was like, well, that's right down my alley. This is my department, the doom and gloom of technology. But then he said we should bring in some positive perspectives. Closer. Yeah, okay. Then he said, as an additional challenge, we should bring in positive perspectives and, uh, and outlooks. And I am... Yeah, I'm a bit afraid I'm going to fail, uh, fail that challenge spectacularly. Because, I mean, yes, oftentimes we think about things like disinformation, misinformation, and so on when we speak about tech. But um, as you will see from my presentation, technologies have much more far-reaching uh, ramifications. And, yeah, this is going to get dark. I'm going to speak about Myanmar. Um, my talk is entitled of uh, Blackouts, Whitelist, and Terrorist Others. Exploring the role of socio-technical imaginaries in state formations in Myanmar. Yes, that's a bit of a handful of a title, but um, don't worry. I'm going to walk you through it, what I mean by that. Um, the reason why I'm talking about Myanmar and not of one of the other nations that you usually hear about when we speak about Facebook and TikTok and social media and so on, is that Myanmar in many ways is a very extreme example. And I think it shows a lot of the tendencies that we see in all societies, but um, same tendencies on steroids. So you can really see the effects that um, unchecked monopolies of a social media company can have. And I mean, these are drastic. So in that sense, I think there's a lot of um, lessons that we can take from uh, uh, the very tragic uh, experience of Myanmar and social media. So this is based on a... 
a paper I published earlier this year. Um, so I will try to weave a bit more newer thinking into this. And I would like to, to invite you to, um, yeah, to, to reconsider a few of our conceptions that we have of, uh, of technology and what it does for us. And especially to kind of overcome these, these simplifying assumptions and narratives that uh, especially tech proponents, proponents from Silicon Valley often feed us. Like, like for example, that um, uh, the digital town square. I'm sorry, who made that up? I mean, that is not what digital technologies are doing. And I think the same is also for um, proponents who say that uh, digital technology is the same as progress. No, it's not. Do you mind? Yes, much better. So, wait, do I have to start from scratch again, or? <laughs> okay, well, I mean, it was introductory anyway, so you can disregard that. Um, but I think it's really about kind of, yeah, reconsidering this easy narrative that uh, tech is selling us, that tech makes everything easier, tech makes everything better, and more connected world is a better world. I have very, very, very large question marks for all of these. Good. So um, let's get into my case and I'll explain why. So basically my case is Myanmar, which on February 1, 2021, woke up to a no internet connection signal. Well, displayed on millions of smartphones. So what had happened was that um, soldiers of the, the Myanmar military had taken over the offices of the major telecommunication providers. They have cut wires, they held uh, guns to people's heads, uh, forced technicians to shut down the internet. So the internet was off and this turned out to be a coup. And the typical interpretation of things like that is that, well, in a coup, the military is an authoritarian actor, so they are afraid of free speech, they are afraid of the internet, because they can't control the internet, so they shut it down. As you will see, this is another one of these simplifying narratives that we still have in our heads. The one of, of liberation technologies. The idea that digital technologies is somehow something that... Um, fosters democracy, or that helps civil societies organize and overthrow their dictators. It's a myth or a notion that has been around since, mostly since the Arab Spring uprisings, and a lot of it is still believed, even though there's, if you look at what actually happened in these cases, there's very little to this myth. But also if you look at Myanmar, I mean, after the coup, you have seen a lot of so-called Instagrammable protests. I mean, street protests sprung up and they were framed in a way that made them shareable, that made them go viral, they were staged and performed in a way that actually, yeah, makes these things Instagrammable. So these digital technologies, they, they play the role in how political action happened. At the same time, you also had um, civil diso disobedience movements who were organizing via Facebook, who were organizing strikes in, strikes in the public sector, who literally stopped the whole country from functioning. And yes, Facebook played a role in that. And you also had countrywide internet blackouts that make you think, well, okay, so the military was really afraid of the internet and that's why they shut it down. Now, at first glance, it seems confirmed, so these liberation technologies, uh, again, are playing their role. But then, easy narratives are not really my thing, I'm more in the yeah, doom and gloom territory. So, maybe there is a more complicated story here. So, if internet is so fundamental to democratic rights and against authoritarian actors, then why are democratic resistance groups blowing up mobile phone towers. Yeah, they're basically taking down the internet. And I think when you're looking closer at what technologies actually do in specific contexts, then you would find a lot of these oddities. And uh, this is what I'm going to delve into. So I started wondering, okay, um, how is digital tech actually entangled with armed conflict and state formation? What kind of political 
agency is digital tech developing? And that is far beyond just disinformation, misinformation, fake news. Actually, as, as you will see, um, digital tech is so deeply ingrained and entangled with our societies nowadays that um, it goes to the very foundations of, uh, of how we function as societies. And I am thankful for, uh, for Dr. Trisha, who mentioned uh, Benedict Anderson's concept of uh, imagined nations. Because in my work, I use similar concepts that speak to how nations are formed and imagined. And, well, I would say it's not the newspapers anymore. It's other technologies. And that includes things like Meta or Facebook, that includes 4G mobile towers, that includes cables, that includes smartphones, apps. And we have to actually look at these to understand political conflicts today. And not just at the, the military and the activists and, and so on. Good. Um, yeah, quickly I'm going to talk about my uh, approach to that, where I'm coming from with this perspective, then very quickly going to talk about digital tech in Myanmar, blackouts and terrorist others, and then attempt a conclusion. So my approach, I mean, it has been mentioned in the uh, very generous introduction. Thank you again for that. And uh, we will talk about uh, your employment in the future. <laughs> um, so what I'm using is um, a strong influence from science and technology studies. I mean, background is political science and sociology, yes. Science and technology studies is basically a social science perspective on tech. So I'm interested in how society shapes technology and vice versa. So the idea is that these two are actually in consistent interaction. And that means that, uh, yeah, technologies are not understood as neutral tools. They have their politics, full stop. There's no way around it. And one particularly interesting bit is that um, technologies are often part of so-called socio-technical imaginaries. That is especially for infrastructures, where specific infrastructures are kind of at the base of how a nation or a community or a region um, imagines itself, how it performs itself, how it practices itself. And this will get clearer when I come to the examples, don't worry. Um, the second bit that I would like to stress here is um, that the SDS that I'm using is a, well, very explicitly decolonial. I think what we oftentimes overlook is that um, a lot of the tech companies are coming from a specific place in the, on the earth, and that is Silicon Valley, and then they are kind of projected into the rest of the world. I mean, this is the understanding that um, tech is developed there, and then it trickles down. And I would like to question or to interrogate that notion, because uh, it's not true. I mean, developing countries especially, they oftentimes play rather fundamental roles in developing technology, specifically in public policy, health, um, policing, government, and so on, that oftentimes the periphery, or formerly the colonies, were actually used as sites for experimentation and so on, and then technology would be imported back into the metropolis. I mean, most prominent example, probably the fingerprint, that wasn't in, uh, invented in England. It was used by the English in the, in the, in the, uh, under the British Raj, in the colony, and then at some point found its way back into the metropolis where we all know it from police movies nowadays. And I would say the same is the case for digital technologies, because in many ways, as you will see from my talk, that um, Myanmar has served as a, well, what could be understood as, a, as an imperial laboratory for Facebook. Good. So why talk about Myanmar? And there we have to speak about the rather specific context. I'm trying to keep this short because uh, when it comes to Myanmar, I have a tendency of um, talking and talking and talking more and more. Um, so very quickly, Myanmar uh, was used to, used to be known as a very authoritarian country before um, 2010s. Um, when the military actually announced the transition to democracy, peace and open economy. So they very quickly and, well, very effectively actually introduced reforms to allow freedom of speech, free elections. They at least, uh, released 
opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi from house arrest. Um, they opened the economy for foreign investment and liberalization. And that meant that it basically also connected the country to the internet. Before 2010, um, Myanmar's internet usage was in the single digits, like 7% of the population had access. Uh, a SIM card for your phone was going around 2,000 US dollars, which, yeah, is a bit much. And after this liberalization, the price went down to $1.50 for a SIM card. So suddenly internet became accessible for vast majorities of the, of the population. And Facebook entered this market extremely aggressively with their free basics program where they, uh, when you're using the Facebook app to access stuff, um, they will waive the data cost. So that meant that Facebook on uh, a predominantly mobile market became absolutely dominant. I mean, for many people in Myanmar, Facebook was the internet. When they would Google stuff, they wouldn't Google it. They would actually type things into the search bar within the Facebook app. Because this is where the, uh, the Myanmar internet happened. This is where people had their pages, this is where all the content was, government ministries and so on. They also didn't have their home pages, they just had a Facebook profile page. And as you can imagine, yeah, there were some problems with that massive domination of one actor. So, um, as I said earlier, technology is not just something neutral or politically, well, irrelevant. I mean, it was the military who built that infrastructure of, um, or allowed the building of that infrastructure to, to connect the country via 4G signals. And this was always tied in that kind of idea of we are jumping a few stages because we come late to the game so we jump straight to mobile technology and that impressed a lot of people i mean for example a quote from eric schmidt the google ceo back then when he was visiting myanmar like well the country will leapfrog 20 years and we we will see how they can shape themselves and um, what i believe will be its ra extremely rapid social development i mean the same for the military the military said, well, I mean, this is about technology, yes, but it's also about achieving national unity. So we need infrastructure to connect our national races. The greater the number of roads, ra railroads and bridges the nation sees, the friendlier the relations will be among national races. And I mean, this is a country who has been at war internally for 70 years, like seven decades. This is the longest running civil conflict in the world. And in that sense, it's a bit striking if somebody says, well, okay, well, we can just build a bit of infrastructure, build some roads, railroads, bridges, and then everything will be fine. It usually doesn't work like that. Because when you look at Myanmar, at that time, these are the areas that were controlled by ethnic armed organizations. So these are, what is colored here is basically separate states. I mean, these territories, they functioned as de facto states with their own institutions, ministries, symbols, um, armies, and they were not under direct control by the, by the center. However, the military framed this new idea of the leapfrog of technology, of um, mobile internet, and that goes across these boundaries. I mean, 4G signals, they do not stop at a military checkpoint or at a, an armed group's checkpoint, they are directly palpable within all these territories, even if the military has no direct presence there. So in that sense, connecting the country and creating a unified, connected Myanmar was always uh, very much a one-sided nation-building exercise. And that is obviously highly political. Now, let's go to the place where it went terribly, terribly wrong. Oh, I think I, do I need to hurry up already? No, okay, good. So, when you kind of build your nation or you project a, an idea of a nation um, built on connectivity, just bringing everybody together under, well, 4G network, uh, how do you justify turning the internet off? That's it's kind of difficult, no? So, something that um, 
actually happened over quite a few years is um, is interesting to note here that this idea of the the unified Myanmar the that is connected via this leapfrog, via this progress, via this digital technology, that also created a, a racialized, threatening terrorist other. So basically you have one, an idea of a Myanmar as a connected unity, but then also somebody that needs to be disconnected from that, that in the name of security needs to be excluded from this. I mean, this is a very typical construction that you find quite often. In Myanmar, this had rather drastic kind of a consequence. I mean, I imagine you are familiar with um, the genocide against uh, the Rohingya minority. And this framing of the, the threatening terrorist other, I mean, that was first used, yes, against the Rohingya. But it was also a, a heavily digitized phenomenon. I mean, yes, it obviously had uh, its real world implications. But to make that possible, um, the military run very extensive astroturfing networks. Uh, that were fostering public opinion, that were influencing, that were, um, well, spitting online hate speech. It went to a point where the New York Times actually spoke of a genocide incited on Facebook with posts from Myanmar's military. So the military ran its troll factories where hundreds of soldiers did nothing else than typing. Typing comments, repeating the, the military's narrative, saying that this is not a genocide, they made it all up, and even running cons inconspicuous influencer uh, networks where they promoted well, skincare, um, celebrity news, um, football results, and who you are supposed to hate today. So, in that sense, you see Facebook, well, was kind of directly involved in that. Now, interestingly, this um, idea of a terrorist other that needs to be disconnected, I mean, the, the military started to, to use that on other people, not just the Rohingya. It also, from 2018 onwards, um, invoked this terrorist other, um, this time against the Arakan army. And there it was also justified to, to disconnect the whole of Rakhine State for 18 months. That was, I think, the longest um, internet shutdown in history then. And again, it was about well, performing an authority in an area where the military is not directly present. Now, with the, with the fe uh, February 2021 coup, the military suddenly extended this construction of the terrorist other to everybody. I mean, now it included protesters, civil disobedience groups, activists, nurses who were on strike, uh, teachers who were on strike, the exile government, basically everybody now was labeled a terrorist and hence had to be disconnected. And there you can see a lot of new practices or authoritarian practices that come up where controlling connectivity becomes one of the, the main prime aim. It's not about connecting anymore, it's not about disconnecting anymore, it's about that balance that I call uh, this slash connection, where you have a, a whitelisted internet, that means that you can only um, access certain sites that have been pre-authorized, uh, you have a ban on social media and that kind of alternates with complete blackouts, um, at the same time soldiers are actively using social media, um, TikTok quite infamously, to, well, to influence public discourse and um, try to find information on resistance movements and so on. It's what they call information combat. So, in that sense, um, yeah, we're coming back to the initial question, why did we blow up network towers? I mean, I think I've given you an idea that um, it wasn't just the, the resistance movement that was tech savvy and that used um, social media and connectivity to its advantage. It was the military as well, and they were very, very good at it. So, in that sense, digital technologies have a lot of different um, effects that they realize, and some of them are democratic, yes. Some of them are the absolute opposite of democratic. And that means that uh, network towers have become non-living targets in, in guerrilla warfare. I mean, you are targeting the military's investment because these are Mitel Tower, which is a military-owned company, so you blow them up. And with that, it also kind of emphasizes how digital technology itself 
takes on various strange roles in this conflict. Because from a from blowing up a mobile phone tower, you actually gain a lot of materials like um, batteries, uh, generators, solar panels. These are tremendously helpful for guerrilla warfare, believe me. And you can even build astonishingly accurate improvised grenade launchers from scrap metals that you get from a mobile phone tower. So in that sense, a lot of the technology is injected into certain spaces and has um, a lot of effects that we can barely understand. And I think it's high time to, to reconsider of how much we actually need or whether we should consider some of these implications before we launch ourselves aggressively into new markets. And this might be my, my conclusion, I think. That, yeah, I mean, there, there is a lot of ambiguity in there. I mean, as I said, this simplifying binary of um, democratic actors connect and authoritarian actors they disconnect is far too simplistic. I mean, we live in a world where there's a lot of um, entangled, intermeshed um, assemblages of, uh, of different factors that, uh, that produce our final results that we observe. And in Myanmar, you see that uh, well, all sides have made very extensive and strategic use of digital tech. I mean, the military, the civil disobedience movement, people's defense forces. And yeah, some of them have democratizing effects, others have not, or are they quite the opposite. And I think from a broader perspective, and there I'm trying to, to kind of link to what the other speakers have said, that brings us back to the question of, um, well, if technology has such ambiguous and potentially harmful effects, well, that's very unpleasant for a lot of international actors who have projected their technology very aggressively into places without asking much or without being prepared for any kind of negative effects coming from it. I mean, Facebook being there a, a prime example. And I think when you look at how aggressively Facebook expanded in Myanmar and then just, well, basically winged it, muddled through, ignored warnings, um, somehow came up with a few policy solutions after the New York Times pointed them out as being at the center of a genocide. I mean, that's a very, very long time to react. And it almost looks like um, a very experimental kind of mindset. Moving into a developing country, we can deploy our things, we can try things out, um, we move fast, we break things. And I'm sorry, this mindset is just not enough, not anymore. And developing countries deserve better than serving as a, the imperial laboratories where tech giants can experiment without any consequence or without considering their political effects. Good, I'm going to stop here. Um, and yeah, maybe I can spread some optimism after the doom and gloom in the comments and questions. Good, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Stefan, for the extremely um, powerful insight about the double-edged narratives that the internet can spread and the application of technology in war. Um, I do believe that we have enough time for about one or two questions from the crowd. So just raise your hands if you have any questions for Dr. Stefan, and I will give you this microphone. Yes, you in the middle. Uh, thanks for the speech, Dr. Stefan. I just want to know a little more about the context of Myanmar. So initially, like Facebook aggressively expanded, and then we saw the government started to create these like uh, very anti-terrorist or very anti-minority uh, groups on Facebook. So initially, Facebook did nothing in terms of moderating this or in terms of trying to stop this hate speech. And when it was pointed out by, as you said, the New York Times, did they try anything at all in terms of moderation or were they largely unsuccessful? Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, it's um, well. The whole story is even more embarrassing for Facebook than, than you, I even hinted at. But um, I can't go into all the, the details here. But I mean, honestly, if you if you look at this from nowadays perspective, it's quite shocking. I mean, to give you an example, um, Myanmar has 50 million people. Have a guess how many content moderators Facebook had in 2015 
um, when some of the first effects of that were visible. How many content moderators did they have who speak Burmese? And that is only the majority language. How many? Have a guess. No, it wasn't zero. Double digits? Something in the double digits? Probably ten? It was one. Oh. <laughs> I think the year after, they increased that by 100%, making it two. <laughs> and, I mean, this is a longer answer then, but um, a lot of it, well, relied on being able to ignore things, because Myanmar was considered as something that nobody really was caring that much about in, in seeing the Silicon Valley, until it was literally landing at the doorstep saying that, uh, hey, New York Times front page um, genocide, um, okay, that's bad for PR. And before that, I mean, and even after that, I mean, I think they have like 200 now of our content moderators, but a lot of it was like fleeing into these tech utopian narratives of, a, oh, we're just going to find an AI who actually can fix that. And I mean, I would love to see, I would love to show you a few examples of their first tests where they failed again, quite miserably. Um, it's the kind of, well, I would call it a, a tech utopian mindset where they see their technology as progress per se, unquestionable. It needs to be there, there's no question. And then it's a technical question of finding solutions to the problems it creates, but never questioning the technology itself. And I think we as societies, we actually should start doing that much more. Uh, just one last question, that's okay. Um, yeah, so um, leading on from that point, basically, um, what do you recommend, you know, or do you have any recommendations in mind when it comes to bringing these technologies in? I mean, the the slapstick, I think, answer would be, oh, just throw in the technology and then have like a lot of moderators or have an AI moderated. But we all know, uh, especially in, in these uh, developing countries, there's a lot of different contexts. For example, I'm not sure of the case in Myanmar, but there's like uh, different ethnic groups with their own de facto states. Did they have their own Facebook group? So then who, how do you determine who's right, who's wrong in those scenarios? So any recommendations? Exactly. I mean, I think um, a lot of it boils down to, I mean, there are no easy solutions to these kind of questions. I mean, yeah, we have seen that. Um, I think a lot of it is maybe to rein in certain technological companies and force them to, to develop certain things or otherwise accept boundaries. I mean, the kind of endless growth, endless data production, um, endless new oil, we can discuss about that afterwards. <laughs> um, I think that is just not flying anymore. And I think we, meet, for that we need pressure from uh, politicians, from civil society, from all corners basically. And I think a lot of it boils down to us as end users of these products. Is there really a sensitivity for that model of data colonialism or data generation at any cost that we so easily subscribe to? I mean, all of us enable that by saying, hey, I don't want to pay for a messenger service. I use the free one. But I mean, there's this very old saying that I'm sure you've heard ad nauseum now, that if you don't pay for a product, you are not a client. You're not a user of it. You are the product. It's your information. It's your data. It's you being sold. And I think we need to come to a point where people realize that and are willing to, well, maybe pay for certain services and pay for a service that is uh, done in a way that is not relying on, on selling you or your information. And there is some examples for that. But yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you. All right, can we do this one last quick check to see if there's one more question we can get from the audience? All right, cool. Thank you very much, Dr. Stefan. Thank you. Thank you.